Whales communicate, sure, but how do they say what they're saying? Researchers have constructed a phonetic alphabet of sperm whale sounds, and what they've discovered allows for combinatorial complexity that works surprisingly like human language. Can we eavesdrop on the whales? Their clicks may contain signs. Cetaceans are wicked smart, arguably smarter than humans. As the philosopher Douglas Adams put it in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, man had always assumed he was much more intelligent than dolphins because he had achieved so much. The Wheel, New York, wars, and so on. Whilst all the dolphins had ever done was muck about in the water having a good time. But conversely, the dolphins had always believed they were more intelligent than man for precisely the same reasons. We can't know whether dolphins or any other cetaceans really think they're smarter than we are, if for no other reason than that we can't communicate with them to find out. Scientists have been working to bridge the language barrier between humans and cetaceans for decades. In the 1960s, one Caltech neuroscientist funded by NASA and the U.S. Navy tried to teach dolphins to speak English. After all, they can make noises, we can make noises. How about we teach them to make our noises. The project had plenty of problems, but not the least was, dolphins and mouths aren't suited to make human noises? Think about dolphin mouths. Is that well suited to a mmm noise? Yeah, no. If anything, we should be the ones learning to make cetacean noises, right? We can synthesize audio more easily than they can make a p noise after all. So, if we really want to find out whether Cetaceans believe they're more intelligent than we are because they never invented New York, shouldn't we be learning their language in order to play it back to them or something? Well, yes. That's exactly what researchers at SETI are looking for. No, not that SETI the Cetacean Translation Initiative. Started in 2020, this SETI is using machine learning to identify linguistic patterns and communication between sperm whales in the Eastern Caribbean. Sperm whales aren't big singers like humpback whales are. They instead communicate in groups of cliques called codas, which is one of the many musical terms used in this field, even if it's not quite in the same way as you might encounter them in music theory class. In this case, each coda is a group of 3 to 40 clicks. If they seem like fancy Morse code, that's about right. The idea of take a bunch of whale audio and use machine learning to classify different patterns is not a new one. Previous studies were able to identify about 150 discrete types of sperm whale codas, of which 21 were found in the Eastern Caribbean. You can communicate with 21 information-carrying units. But that is a serious limitation on how much complexity you can convey. If SETI's population of sperm whales were really only limited to what could be expressed by 21 informational-carrying units, could they really engage in the type of coordinated social behaviors we observe? Our researchers thought not, so they figured there must be more information conveyed by those codas than the pattern of clicks alone. After all, even in the simplest communication systems, animals combine different parameters to convey more complex ideas. Bees have their, the food is over here, dance. Well, they have two dance shapes. The round dance, if the food is close by, and the so-called waggle dance, if the food is farther away. That farther away dance also uses directionality because no one wants to go off flying in the wrong direction on a long schlep. So the bee orients the shape of its dance relative to the sun to show the direction of the food source and now we know it's far away and roughly where to go to find it. The speed of the dance conveys even more distance information. The slower the bee can completes its circuit the farther away the food source is. On the surface, it looks like bees only had two informational carrying units, 
the round dance for the short distance, the waggle dance for long. But the bee can convey way more than two ideas to its neighbors because tempo and direction are also variables that convey information through that same waggle dance. Human spoken language works in a similar way, conveying complex ideas through simple components combined together in various ways. Individual phonemes, the atomic speech sounds that make up spoken language, are themselves products of combination. What shape are your lips making? Where is your tongue positioned? Do you put airflow behind it? Those are things that make the difference between things like ah and ooh. Each human language uses a subset of these phonemes. No language uses every possible mouth noise a human can make. And if you've ever learned a foreign language or even practiced an accent or dialect, you've probably encountered the, how do I make my mouth do that? We don't have this sound the way that I speak problem. Linguists use a tool called the International Phonetic Alphabet to catalog all these different sounds and sound parameters. You may have seen them in the pronunciation section of a dictionary, and it may not have been terribly helpful because IPA is full of weird letters that you don't know how to pronounce unless you've learned IPA. The advantage is that unlike English spelling, the pronunciations don't overlap. That's the whole point. So may contain science looks like me i kun te in sa i uns, which, you know, reads that way if I'm slowing down and splitting out all those diphthongs we sm smoosh together in English. Kind of makes me sound like Dory speaking whale now that I think of it. These sounds are our building blocks. We build phonemes into words and words into sentences. American English has roughly 43 to 44 phonemes, if you count the diphthongs, which is actually one of the highest among human languages, which tend to average around mid-20s to mid-30s, and each, again, use a different subset of sounds from that terrifying, confusing IPA chart. But that number is actually roughly around the number of codas that our Eastern Caribbean sperm whales have, so please. Meet the sperm whale phonetic alphabet. After classifying 8,719 codas across the 21 previously identified coda types, uh, you see 18 on the left there because three coda types didn't show up a lot, our researchers sorted them based on the frequency at which that particular rhythmic pattern showed up and the tempo at which it was used. As you can see, some codas mostly only showed up at one tempo, like Coda 2, or click, click, click. Other rhythmic patterns were used across varying tempi, like number 4, or click, 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 click. The study's authors also found two other parameters by which sperm whales created variation in their clicks. One they called rubato. In music, rubato is a give and take within a given tempo. Overall, you may be going at a modern moderate speed. Within each phrase, though, you may slow down and then you speed back up. So on average, you might hit 80 beats per minute, but there's a lot of variance from phrase to phrase. In music, Chopin is a composer whose music is typically performed with hello rubato, in contrast to someone like the mathematically precise Bach. Sperm whale codas have a similar internal variation to their tempo. Sometimes it's an even click, 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 click. Sometimes it's click, 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 click. And if that seems like it could have just been random variation and it's too subtle to convey meaning, just remember the difference between, yeah, sure, and yeah, sure. The other variable researchers found was ornamentation, an extra click thrown in there, a click, so to speak. For instance, one back and forth started off with six clicks, then got a response of repeated five-click codas. The six-coda click was almost exactly like the five-click coda, except, of course, for the extra click. And as researchers analyzed the various coda samples, that phenomenon kept coming up. Variations of a distinct coda type with an extra little click here and there. And they don't show up randomly. 
they're in distinct positions and most commonly at the beginnings of exchanges, like our six and then five click example. Ornamented codas led to changes in the chorusing conversation of groups of whales more often than unornamented codas, and collectively, these all suggest that ornamentation is another axis of variation that allows sperm whales to convey information, like the angle of the bee dance. The idea then is that where humans have three primary axes of variation in spoken language, lip position, tongue position, voicedness, that allow for this terrifyingly diverse array of phonemes, whales likewise have four. In their case, pattern, tempo, rubato, and ornamentation. Again, before, all we were able to previously identify was the pattern. So this study hugely expands the complexity that we understand sperm whales to be capable of conveying, which in turn fits much more with what we see from what whales are able to achieve through their communication system. And awareness of these variables will empower future studies to analyze them as linguistics in other sperm whale communities. After all, not all axes of variation are used in all human vocal languages, nor all the same way. Variations in pitch convey meaning in many, if not most, spoken languages, but in tonal languages, they're a lexical or grammatical component of the language. These axes of variation found in Eastern Caribbean sperm whales may be the same way. Different whale communities have different patterns to their codas, but like tonality in human language, they may use rubato or ornamentation, or they may not. So, does this mean that we can speak whale now? Alas, no. You're going to have to wait a little while longer if you want to ask that whale's mom out on a nice dinner date. The study didn't focus on semantics or the context or meaning of any of these sounds, just the structural elements of how they're put together. This study gives us a firmer sense of the building blocks of sperm whale language, and that's a precondition to ever studying cetacean semantics in a meaningful way. But let me tell you, first opportunity I get, you better believe I'm taking a class in whale as a language credit. Click click.